Thank you, Dr. Friedemann. Check one, two. Check one, two. Whoops. In good biblical Wesleyan fashion. Billy Graham once told this story about what faith is. There once was a a tightrope walker, and he was going to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls, and he was going to do it blindfolded and pushing a wheelbarrow in front of him. And the crowd was amassing, and uh, as he was getting ready, he picked one person out from the crowd and said, You, do you believe I can roll this barrel across Niagara Falls, across this tightrope, blindfolded? The person said, yes, I believe. We're going to learn about some characteristics of the Father this morning, some glorious, holy, perfect, infinite characteristics of the Father. And in order to do that, we'll, we'll start reading from the Gospel of John Verses 18 through 29, Gospel of John 5, 18 through 29. Gospel of John chapter 5, 18 through 29. For this reason, and I, I apologize because there should be a reason before this, but there's all, this all over the Bible, and I had to pick some passage here to, to, uh, to preach on, so forgive me what comes before. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were speaking all the more to kill him, because not, he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you may marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And will come forth those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life. And those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Another question, well one question this morning is. What is a sermon without some kind of mention of a Gallup poll. Okay, here's a taste of the American religious and non-religious landscape. One Gallup poll stated, as June 2002 Gallup poll reveals, that 80% of U.S. adults consider themselves to be part of the Christian tradition. Eight out of ten Americans consider themselves to be part of the Christian tradition. Another Gallup poll, same year, 2002, states, eight in ten Americans have consistently held the belief that Jesus Christ is God or the Son of God. When we examine Gallup data, data, when we examine Gallup data in greater detail, when we examine Gallup data in greater detail, we discover about half this group holds the orthodox position. The key there is greater detail. When we examine in greater detail and we poll the 8 out of 10 Americans who say, yes, I believe, only four of them, half of them, will hold the biblical orthodox position. 
that Jesus was in fact God living among men, while most of the remainder believed that Jesus was divine only in the sense that he was a man who, uniquely, who was uniquely called by God to reveal God's purpose in the world. In order to understand or begin to understand John 5, 18 through 29, we have to read or understand somewhat the prologue of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 19. And in part, the rest of the Gospel of John from 120 onward, in part, illustrate, illustrates or fleshes out what is in the prologue. So we would expect that John 5, 18 through 29, would in part flesh out a bit of the prologue for us. But what's in the prologue? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus always was God the Son. From time eternal past to time eternal future, he will be always God the Son. Son of God means God the Son. Eternally with the Father, the second clause of John 1.1. 1, 1. He is eternally with the Father in perfect and holy, eternal fellowship. And what the Father is by nature, third part of John 1.1, 1, 1, the Son shares in that same essence or substance. What the Son is, the Father is. What the Father is, the Son is. And they exist with each other. It's the beginning, at least here, of Trinitarian theology, biblical Trinitarian theology. And we also notice throughout the Gospel of John in good Trinitarian fashion that the Spirit always points to Jesus, John chapters 14 through 16. He points us to Jesus. And, wonderfully so, Jesus points us to the Father. In John 1.18, I discovered this last year for the first time. In John 1.18, we read, No one has seen God, the Father, at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, has revealed Him. You know what the verb there for revealed is? Exegesis. Exegisato. Jesus exegetes the Father. That sounds kind of cold at first, doesn't it? But when we see Jesus, we see the Father. Not that Jesus is the Father, but when we see Jesus, we see the Father. Jesus draws out the meaning of the Father for us and walks among the people in John chapter 1. He is the living, walking exegesis of the Father. And indeed, in John 1.14, we have beheld his glory. He became flesh. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Another sermon or 600 on that. But in Jesus Christ dwells the glory of God. His body is the temple. And we have this eternally in the bosom of the Father in John 1.18. He eternally is in the bosom of the Father. This eternal, pure, and holy love, fellowship between Jesus and the Father. So we bring that to John 5, 18 through 29. He's calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Of course, in part, John 1, 1, he is equal in essence to the Father. For just as, and that F-O-R is very important. When you read an F-O-R in the English Bible or in an order of that, read before it. Because now we're having an explanation. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son to have life in himself. This mutual indwelling relationship between the Father and the Son. As the Spirit right this moment points us to this relationship. He gave him authority to execute, execute judgment because he is the son of man. Mm. Can't understand that, not only with, without the prologue, but without Daniel 7, 13 through 15, where the nations are judged and the son of man ascends the throne and sits next to the ancient of days. And all nations come before the son of man. 
Do not marvel at this, excuse me, uh, verse uh, 20. The Father loves the Son, John 1, 18, eternally in the bosom of the Father, and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And only he who is God the Son, by the way, can do the things the Father does. And the Father will show Jesus greater works than this, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He wishes. Isn't that amazing? But the Son does never wish or desire anything outside the will of the Father because they are in perfect, eternal fellowship with one another. So, uh, for not even, verse 22, the Father judges anyone, but he, hasn't given, he has given all judgment to the Son. The Father has given to the Son, with whom he is in divine fellowship, closeness from all eternity. He's given him the authority to judge. It is a divine prerogative of Jesus, the Christ, to judge. But he does this in perfect harmony and fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. In order that, why does the Father give the Son authority to judge? In order that, we all who are reading this gospel will honor the Son just as we honor the Father. Because the Father does not desire us only to honor Him, but to honor the Son. And in doing so, when we honor the Son because He has revealed or exegeted the Father, we honor the Father by the ministry and grace of the Holy Spirit. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word. Now, I want you to please listen to this carefully because I'm going to bring up some more illustrations for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me. The Trinity, God eternally as three persons, is truth and the fount of truth. The fount of all truth. And Jesus Christ says to to us, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth. Not only that, from Him all sub-truths come because He is the Lord of truth, because He is truth. Do we hear His voice? Notice the next section is is telling us that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and will rise, some to death, some to light. Sam Harris, the very popular atheist in the United States, in his Letter to a Christian Nation, the book, Letter to a Christian Nation, he boldly challenges the influence that faith has on public life in our nation. In his section in the book, Note to the Reader, he writes, 44% 44% of, American pop, of the American population is convinced that Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead sometime in the next 50 years. According to the most common interpretation of biblical prophecy, Jesus will return only after things have gone horribly awry here on earth. It is, therefore, not an exaggeration to say that if the city of New York were suddenly replaced by a ball of fire, some significant percentage of the American population would see a silver lining in the subsequent mushroom cloud, as it would suggest to them that the best thing that is ever going to happen was about to happen, the return of Christ. It should be blindingly obvious that beliefs of this sort will do little to help us create a durable future for ourselves, socially, economically, environmentally, or geopolitically. Imagine the consequences if any significant component of the U.S. government actually believe that the world was about to end and that its ending would be glorious. The fact that nearly half of the American population apparently believes this purely on the basis of religious dogma should be considered a moral and intellectual emergency. Again, I'm going to repeat that. 
purely on the basis of religious dogma. The book you are about to read, his book, is my response to this emergency. Now, apart from at least this section quoted in an in a internet article, is nothing but rhetoric. Richard Dawkins also supports the book. And Richard Dawkins, now listen to this carefully, he's an atheist. He believes that the universe ultimately has no purpose. Dawkins also stated in his book, River Out of Eden, he mentions this, the universe... No design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And yet he writes about this book. I dare you to read this book. It will not leave you unchanged. Read it if it's the, as if it's the last thing you do. Why? Read it as if it's the last thing you do. He's an evangelist, isn't he? He's an evangelist in a world that has no purpose, no design, no meaning, but pitiless indifference. So why does he say this? Read it as if if it's the last thing you do. Is there a purpose to all this? Is there a purpose to what he's saying? Atheists are, for the most part, or many that I've dealt with, intellectually bankrupt. As as brilliant as they may seem to the world, they are, as we say in New England, as dumb as a haddock. Because they don't know how to think. How do we think rightly when we believe in Jesus Christ? It's the only way to think ultimately rightly especially when it comes to the salvation of souls. Here's another response or blurb for the book of Harris. This person leaves it unsigned. He's a New York Times best-selling author. But he doesn't want to put his name on it because he writes books about business. And if, he, if people know about this, he says, he'll lose his career, whatever that means. But he says, as long as science and rational thought are under attack by the misguided yet pious majority. Our nation is in jeopardy. I'm scared. You should be too. Please buy two, one for you and one for a friend you care about. Does that sound like evangelism? (laughs) But as long as rational thought is under attack. Is this rational thought? In In this quote, we have mention of rational thought as opposed to deeply held superstitions and bigotry of the masses. That's what this person says. There are deeply held superstitions and there's bigotry of the masses. Now, this signals a few concerns. What would Anonymous think of Richard Dawkins? Why does anyone think that the masses possess superstitions and bigotry? These are questions for us in the field that is among us that's ripe unto harvest. Why do, does Anonymous think that the masses possess superstitions and bigotry? It could be because Anonymous does not care about rational arguments, he's heard in the past. It could be because Anonymous only cares about irrationality, as demonstrated by Dawkins. It could be because most people do not know how to think and how to articulate the beliefs, their beliefs. But would Anonymous care if beliefs were articulated rationally to himself? Obviously, he doesn't care about the irrationality of Dawkins. Do the earlier mention four out of ten Americans who consider to claim biblical orthodox view of Jesus, do they articulate their faith well enough to appeal to Anonymous's need for rationality or supposed need for rationality? What do we make of all this? Well, humanity is a mess. We have a plethora of religious and non-religious claims wherein only one is true. So do we possess the truth? And are we able to articulate it 
to a lost and dying world. In the gospel, verse 25, chapter 5, truly, Jesus is truth. So his words are truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the atheists who have died, when all others who have died will hear the voice of the Son of God. That's a hearkening back to Ezekiel 37, where the dead will hear the voice of Yahweh. Jesus claims to be Yahweh the Son with the divine prerogative of His voice being the one that the dead will hear. And this glorifies the Father. And it glorifies the Spirit who points us to Jesus, who points to the Father. Those who hear will live. Because... Just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave life to the Son to have life in Himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 1, in Him was life. Jesus is the fount with the Father and the Spirit of the very life we have and of the very eternal life we have. Stop and think with me for a moment. You and I are thinking right now. We are alive. What is individuality? He created us individually. What does it mean to exist? We're here. It's it's not nothing. We're here as personalities, as living beings. Because of the life that is in Jesus and the eternal life that we gather from him that he gives to us. Not when I'm driving, but oftentimes when I'm in stationary, I think of this. Man, I'm something. I'm thinking. Why is there this and nothing? Why is there this and not nothing? But Jesus has life in himself. Verse 27, he gave him, the Father gave him authority to to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. And again, Daniel 7, 13 through 15, key passage. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. An hour is coming, Sam Harris, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. That's scary. I tell that journalist, that author, that scares me. Do we possess the truth? Because I just stood up here and 30 seconds ago said, did you hear that, Sam Harris? But my claims, by God's grace, assume that I have the truth. Otherwise, it's mere empty rhetoric on my part. So do we as the body of Christ, possessed by the Spirit's grace, who points us to Jesus, who exegetes the Father, all in Trinitarian oneness, do we have at our disposal the articulation of a belief system that shows not only beyond a shadow of a doubt, but absolutely that it is the case that Christianity is the only religion on earth that is true. The only religion in the universe that's truth. Do we possess that? If we do, and we know it by the grace of the Holy Spirit, who gives to us absolute certainty, then we can't stand up here and in Walmart and in the cubicle, and in the other pulpits that you may be occupying someday or, to, or have occupied or are occupying, state with absolute certainty, because of the Spirit of God who points us to Jesus, Sam Harris is wrong, and here's why. And if I had Sam Harris here, I would show him why, by God's grace. And tell him... Not invite him. Tell him. 
that he ought to come by grace through faith to the Son of God that he may have life. So, verse 29 is a fearful verse. For us by God's, God, the Holy Spirit's grace to examine ourselves. And it's fearful also because of the world outside of us that's dying in its sins. There will come forth those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Let me modify the Billy Graham illustration. He's getting ready to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope, not Billy Graham, but the tightrope walker, (laughs) for those of you who just came in. Push a wheelbarrow, blindfolded, and he looks down and picks picks out a, a person and says, do you believe that I can wheel this wheelbarrow across this tightrope, blindfolded. Yes, I believe. Well, let me change that a little bit theologically and rightly epistemologically. Let's say that the tightrope walker is getting ready, and he picks out a person, and the person says, yes, I believe, because the person has eyewitness accounts of the tightrope walker doing what he did. And the eyewitness accounts from verifiable, accurate sources say that this is the hundredth time that the tightrope walker has done this, and he's done it a hundred times with a person in the barrel. And on this basis, the person in the crowd says, yes, I believe. Then the tightrope walker says, well, come on up and get in. Faith does. Faith does. It gets up and it gets in. And not only does it get in and go for the ride, the analogy breaks down there. The person in the tightrope, excuse me, the person in the wheelbarrow also says, Hey, this is great. Come on up with me next time. Hey, you ought to try this. No, you ought to try this. Do we have that kind of enthusiasm when we point people to the Son of God, God the Son? I maintain that a large reason, or the majority of the time, we have this. We can have this. Hey! This composed fanaticism about Jesus. Because he who is the fount of all truth has enabled us by his grace to delve into, to touch the truth, and to taste it, and to see, and to live it, and to share it. And he who has given us this truth has given us certainty that it is true. And because we know why we believe what we believe and how we believe it, we can take the exegesis of John by his grace. And look at he who exegeted the Father and rightly exegete that exegesis. And the Spirit will use us to point us to Jesus, to the Father, all in divine love, in unity, as the three persons work, in infinite, perfect, pure holiness. Come up and get in and live a life that will, and I preach to myself too as well, let's live a life so that when we are raised up from the dead at the voice of the Son of Man, he will say to us, come.